that's six million and one hundred eighty thousand dollars of value and a very conservative and most likely it's way 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 more than that minimum on a conservative 350 or 450 percent roi so what i'm about to share with everybody is based on nine years of experience one of the highest roi things you can do for your law firm is secret number one is the virtual assistants offers you specialized work and specialists always outperform generalists neil what are your thoughts about this yeah, I think that's true. I think you have to go in with the mindset of understanding that when you're gonna when you're gonna hire a virtual assistant to do a specific task or an area of work, you're gonna be much successful if you you know if you focus in on that. So if you want a, you know, a, a VA to help you develop graphics for your social media channels, for instance, just because you don't want to play around in Canva all day long. Well, you're going to want one who has you know, specialized skills in that area. And so those types of VAs, those specialists, clearly outperform somebody who is just available for time and does a lot of different things. Um, and that's one of the main benefits of virtual assistants is finding those very specialized one kind of one jack of all, you know, one person that does one thing versus the jack of all trades. And over time, I realized the people that I worked with so office is very generalist, but over time, it became even more and more specific and more refined towards only one certain thing. Just to give some idea, let's just say I have one or two people dedicated just for Zapier. I have another person who is just dedicated to Google Tag Manager, et cetera, et cetera. And even though it may not be a full-time role, and some of these are, most of these are full-time, but a lot of them are not. But every time I have that problem or that issue, well, I'm able to go to that person. And the good benefit of Upwork is you're not just paying for for you to have them on your payroll. They only pay them for the hours that they work. So there are some people that I have that I only tap into them once every couple of weeks, every once every couple of months when those issues arise. And, you know, at this point, I've kind of built up that repertoire of all the, these virtual assistants that any issues that I run to, I could just run to my Slack or to my Skype and get that sorted out right away, sure access. Hey, can you fix this for me? They fixed it. Great. Thank you so much. I'll be in touch with you for anything that comes up in the future. Yeah, I think it's a mindset too, Sam, that you have to start thinking about your workflow in discrete, you know, sizable chunks that you can consider having a VA perform. I mean, I think we as attorneys oftentimes think of growing our law firm in terms of body of people. And we think, you know, the whole person, which is fine for, for some roles, but if you start taking a more granular look at your workflow, you'll see opportunities to parse that out to specialists who can do things much more efficiently and, and be more accountable. And then a little calculation that we did earlier, Neil, the $20 an hour of value, it's way more than that, especially if it's a very uh, specialized role. So be mindful, the more specialized the work, the more valuable the work is. And also be mindful of that when you're looking to hire, be okay with paying more, the more specialized it is. Versus a generalist VA who only, let's just say, only deals with answering your emails, that's a very generalist work. Well, somebody who does deals with Google Tag Manager, that's specialized technical knowledge that they need to have. So for that, you know, you know, be open to pay more for, for those kinds of roles. Sam, what, what are your thoughts on having your VAs have direct contact with your clients? I know that's a issue for a, a lot of attorneys. It's totally, I highly, highly recommend it. It requires a lot of what we will be talking about later, which is our SOPs, guidelines, frameworks, and things where basically you want your team to follow your recipe the way that you want to be handled. And some people thrive at it, some people are not. And we'll be discussing these. And I think as we chip away in these secrets, I think it will give you a little clues on how to do that better. And I think the <laughs> second point, actually, and the secret number two will be on this, which is what I call the rule of twos. It's something that I shared inside of our program. There are some things in life that you want to do two at a time. Maybe in a personal you know, aspect, you know, maybe you should always be focused. But there are some aspects, such as when you're hiring VAs, when you're creating ads, when you're creating landing pages, when you're creating, creating any kind of creative work, Usually what I like doing is create having variety so I could quickly tell what is better. That's the that's one of the benefits of being online, that you're able to quickly test things out. 
it's kind of like faster uh, iterations, faster way to kind of get a, a faster feedback loop to know what works, what doesn't, and be able to m make adjustments based on that. So with virtual assistants, it's much easier to hire, find, hire, and onboard a VA than it is to hire an in-house employee. In-house employee, oh, yeah. you know, again, your your market is capped, so it's already hard enough to find people to interview. And then if you if you find people to interview, then it's hard to find people that are great. If you find somebody, you know, it takes a lot of work and effort to be able to train them and onboard them. And there's also HR issues and considerations to have in mind in the first 90 days. You know, you know, the cause for termination and things like that. You have to be really mindful of. However, when it comes to VAs, you're not dealing with a lot of those issues and liabilities and risks. You're able to quickly hire from a big talent pool, and you're also able to quickly terminate once you know that that person is not the right person for your team. So what I do when it comes to whenever I hire virtual assistants, I was hired too. It's a rule of thumb that I have. Let me let me quickly bring on two people. Let me give them both work to start. And I'm looking for signs early on who's the most responsive, who's quicker to respond, who writes better, who cares more, who's going to do a better job, who gets it done quicker. All these little clues add up. And it, usually you could tell right away who has those characteristics. And what I found is just a matter of really regular mindset is one out of two is amazing. One out of two is not. And I'd rather know who that is early on so I can move on with that good person and not be stuck in a situation where I bring somebody on and I'm kind of in a situation where maybe in the first couple of weeks, I have no idea whether they're good or not. 50-50% chance. If it works out, great. If not, you have a 50% chance that it doesn't. And I'll have to spend another two, you know, another time, continue doing this process again. Well, I'll rather do that, cut that time early, do it at the same time concurrently and get that clarity up front. And sometimes, Neil, you may even find yourself two amazing VAs, and that's great news. Well, if you're yeah. able to create value out of one, it should be pretty easy to create value out of, value out of, out of two. So I always hire two VAs. It works out really well, and I always recommend that as well. You know, I think right now is the you know, start of the American football season, and, and to me, this kind of screams for an analogy. You know, in preseason, if you're looking at wide receivers, for example, you're going to bring in more wide receivers than you're going to carry on the team during the season and you're going to see who performs better you're going to give them specific tasks and run them through specific drills this is no different it is no different you can you bring a couple of vas in during preseason. you give them real work to do and when it comes time to cut down and identify who's going to be on the team now you have data to work with and this also leads to the, the little quote that we always say neil day before you marry. Yep. And it's also good for the other side too. But there are a lot of these things that I share might come off as one-sided or a little bit ruthless. But if you actually think about it and no. think deep, it might, it's actually a good thing for the other side too. You don't want somebody who has, has their hopes up to make this work or make some changes in their life and all of a sudden it doesn't work out. No, you'd rather, both sides would rather have clarity early in the dating, in the dating stage to know where it's going to go before, unfortunately, before people get married, before people start having kids and, you know, having yeah. big commitments down the line. I'd rather have that clarity early on both sides. Let's have, be happy so that every, so that everybody ultimately falls into the right place where they, where they belong. Yeah. And it, it helps clarify what they're best at going forward. So if they're not going to be a good fit for you, they've got, as you said, more clarity of who they may be a, a better fit for in the future. So it doesn't have, you don't have to look at it as like ruthless cutthroat, you know, approach to staffing is it, it's really very wise. So, all right, let's go to circuit number three is that your SOP is your VA's Bible. Neil, what are your thoughts about SOPs? Yeah, it's funny when I started my career, well, four careers ago, when I worked at NASA, standard operating procedures were the backbone of how we got to the moon literally. And so I've always had a soft spot for the importance of creating standard operating procedures. And for a lot of solo practitioners, you know, in the beginning, it's all up here in your head. You don't need to, you, you choose to spend your time elsewhere and you don't start to put down what the process is for how you get the job done. But if you want to scale at some point, you want to add staff, however you may add staff, you're going to have to document your standard operating procedures. And one of the things I found, just as a side benefit, maybe not a side benefit, a primary benefit, 
is when I brought my first VA on board and we went through the onboarding process, what we did was we wrote the procedures at that time as we were doing the onboarding process. And just thinking through how does work get done in my law firm, what are the steps that trigger and what are the events that trigger each step or end each step, that whole analysis, that whole process was so illustrative for me and and ultimately for my VA. I don't think you can emphasize how important this is because it, it's crucial, as you said, to having success with the VA. Yeah, and SOP acts as the, the backbone and the foundation of law firm automation. If you're looking to automate and free yourself up from your law firm, fundamental is you need a standard operating procedure to make that possible. In very simple terms, it's just set, a standard operating procedure is just a set of instructions for everybody in your team to know exactly what to do. And the more clarity that people have about what they need to do, the more likely they are to get the stuff that they need to get done, basically. So, and that's on you as the law firm owner to create this. No one's going to create this for you. And But over time, once you create it, you establish the foundation, then actually your team can step in and, and add to it and improve it and make it be even better. Yeah, I always, I always made the, the maintenance of the SOP part of the job responsibility of the employee, of the VA. Okay. Not only are you responsible for executing this task and performing this function, but you're also responsible for keeping this procedure up to date. So if we change the process, you know, I want the procedure to be updated. Yeah. And a lot of people also struggle with creating one. Well, one is you could start off with the template. The good news is we have the template already made. I made this about five or six years ago when I created our program. This is one of the things that I give away. It's a law firm standard operating procedure template. You could now find for free inside a lawyer club. Again, if you go to joinlawyerclub.com, all these resources, everything, we're giving it all away. It's all there. So start off with that. And then second round is you personalize it. And what I did was I simplified it for you. I just put brackets for you to put your law firm name, put your core values there. If you don't have, don't know what your core values are, I give you some of my ideas. So you can use those. You fill it up. You do the best you can. And at the very least, you kind of fill out the best version as you can. But for the most part, as Neil shared, this is something that you build on an ongoing basis. You and your team, as your uh, next time you're providing instructions for this to be done, well, that needs to be recorded. Have a rule of thumb. Uh, every time you provide instructions, rule of thumb needs to be recorded. So if you're going to be giving instructions live, well, record your Zoom videos. Or what I do is I don't have time to be able to train people live. What I do is I use Loom as a video tool that allows me to record my face, me talking, so people don't get bored of just them looking at a screen. And it also records your screen so you could talk and share exactly when it's to get done. And the mindset is, when this happens, you gotta do this. And then when this happens, you gotta do this. And then keep track of things here. That's usually how the recipe of SOPs are, is thing. When this happens, go do this, and keep track of it here. And just keep it simple. Essentially, just a simple Google Doc with written instructions that's ideally linked out to Loom videos. Super simple, start off there. There are other fancier tools like Monday or Sun, you know, as task managers you can use. There's also a really, really cool one that I did. It's called Scribe, Scribe AI. Yeah. That's a really, really cool one that I really haven't got into because for me, I just like keeping it simple, but you could check that out. But yeah, just keep it simple so that it actually it gets done. Yeah, your, your old adage, done is better than great. All right, let's move on to secret number four is that effective communication is the backbone of remote work. Communication is key for your law firm to be able to perform for your team, to be able to perform to the level that they need to perform. So let's just share the tool that we use for this, Neil. It's Slack. Yeah. It's basically the best internal communication tool. I know that Microsoft has its own tool. Ultimately, what I found is the tool that you use is the best tool. So if you happen to already be using an internal communication tool that works for you, great. If you don't have one, then Slack is what I usually suggest. It's free. For the first five years of me using Slack, it's free. Just very recently in the past year or two, my director insisted that we upgrade. So I'm like, okay, fine, go for it. I think it's about time that we paid in Slack, you know, what they're owed. Um, but what we do is we create Slack channels, which are basically just group chats for each department. That's key. And then also sometimes for each little project. So there's just that we're trying to accomplish integrating our Facebook 
adds to our, you know, to our CRM. Well, one is ideally that should be inside the integration channel. If not, maybe we have a site team that's taking care of that. Well, we create a, a private Slack channel. We drop everybody there. And then now we communicate everything inside of there. And something I realized after seven, eight years of using Slack, I realized a lot of our team was having a lot of side conversations. There was a lot of DMs, direct messages to each other. Some some people were talking to this person. This person was talking to other people, but they weren't. Uh, they were even though they were working on the same same project. So I made a Slack channel announcement. Hey, everybody! From now on, I want every all communication to be done via Slack channels. If there's a Slack channel that is not created yet, let me know so I could create that. But let's not have any more side conversations and DMs to get this done because we want to make sure that we're, everybody's on the same page. So there's no saying. You know, this person said that, oh, well, I don't know. And then you got to pass it off along and then copy and paste stuff. Instead, keep everything in these Slack channels and it get, really gets the job done. And there's tremendous integration opportunities within Slack now as well, which I find very useful. You know, the ability to launch Zoom meetings straight from inside or the, the channel or to invite people to a Zoom conference inside your channel, access to your, your calendar scheduling platform directly from within Slack. So there's a lot of uh, integration that uh, can continually help you automate the, your functions. Great point. Great uh, great point, Neil. Especially, let's just say, if something critical happens, which for us critical is the client sign up. Well, we want our onboarding team to be notified as soon as it happens because we need to, it's not just about contacting the lead right away. We also want to contact the client right away as soon as they're signed up to be able to get them onboarded, to collect their documents, et cetera. So our client onboarding team is notified to via Slack notifications as Neil shared. Yeah, so you 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 have Zapier sending a Slack notification, right? Yeah. It's a short way to integrate anything with anything, but sometimes Slack also has native integrations with sure. the, the DocuSigns or whatever, or your yep. CRM tools or HubSpot, whatever that is. Yep. But yeah, integrations is key so that the right people are notified every time something critical happens, like a new client sign up. And, you know, every time I talk to an attorney who says, you know, VAs didn't work for me or my VA is not working out for me, when you drill down a little bit, what you find almost always is that they're not really communicating with their VA. You know, they're, they've assigned them a task and then they've said, okay, I've put that out there to the, to the VA and I don't have to worry about this. And they don't have any follow-up communication there's no tool for them to stay in contact with their VAs. And then they're surprised or disappointed when they don't get the results that they want. I, I think you're 100% correct here that clear communication and having a standardized communication path is is the key to making remote work impossible. Yeah, and, and usually when it comes to your team's performance, one, again, we mentioned is having clarity on exactly what their role is. And two, if you're having issues, it's usually a tracking issue or a management issue. That means everybody in your team, doesn't matter who it is, needs oversight, needs a manager who oversees what everybody's doing. So manager and tracking, every work, every work, everything that's done needs to be tracked somewhere in a Google Sheet or Monday or your CRM, you know, so that you have clarity and exactly what has been accomplished that day, that week, that month. I'm feeling if you're missing any of those, you know, you're going to have low performance from your team. All right, so let's go to secret number five. Something critical that a lot of people don't do, which is incentivizing performance to maximize results. It's a pretty hot topic. And it's also a very interesting topic because there's some ethical considerations about this one, right? Incentivizing your team. So let me just give a disclaimer. This is not an ethics course. So please consult with your state bar rules and regulations talk to an ethics lawyer to make sure it checks out in your state. But here's the things that I've learned when it comes to ethical considerations. Again, number one, consult with an ethics lawyer. That's number one. Number two is avoid specific client intent and incentives. I never attach signing up a specific client to an incentive. And number three, you could look to create team-based bonuses. I'll try to bonus the entire intake team rather than an individual. And number four, avoid percentages of specific cases. The bonuses should not be based on percentages of specific cases or legal matters. So make sure at least at the very least you check those things out. And again, there might be other considerations, but those are kind of my red, red flags that I always avoid. But however, there are still ways to be able to incentivize your team to perform. The way 
that I like doing it is again, it's this is offered to our usually to our intake team. And what we do, what we do is we create levels of incentives for our team. So let's just say if you sign up an X number of clients, level one, or if you sign up an X number of clients, level two, or X number of clients, level three, then these are the bonuses that you may achieve. So that there's, it's not tied to any specific clients. It's not tied to a thing. It's just based on number of clients that are signed up on a monthly basis that month. This again, make sure that it checks out with your, uh, with your state bar regulations, but that we found to be critical and being very helpful for us to be able to increase our performance when it comes to our teams. You know, one of the things that I did, and in some cases, just recognizing your VA as being an integral part of your team is sufficient to incentivize to high performance. So for instance, as, a, as an example, we make sure that all, all of our VAs, their email address is, is you know, part of the Tyra Law Firm. So when they're communicating with clients via email, they're made to feel part of the team. Right? They're not, the client's not seeing some random Gmail or, or Hotmail uh, address and wondering who, th who this person is. They can immediately recognize that they're a member of the team and then giving them a title. So for instance, I have one VA that, that works primarily with me directly. And so she's identified as my administrative assistant. And for her, that gives her a great sense of belonging and incentivizes her to, to always be thinking of this as our team. It's not, you know, my law firm and she just works for us. And sometimes that's in and of itself is sufficient to get, you know, high performance from your VAs. Absolutely. And it's, and it's free, right? Recognition and yeah. feedback is free and it yeah. can be easily done. It makes them feel good. It makes you feel good. It makes everybody feel good. And it's a win-win so across the board. And Neil, about it, what I do is for everybody on our team, we try to have three uh, key components, which is t uh, what I call TGI, tracking goals and incentives. Everybody is very clear on what needs to get done and that the result of what they do is tracked. Then everybody also has clear goals. Everybody has something to strive towards so that you're not just whimsically doing their job. And the third, ideally, they also have incentives to be able to accomplish their goals. And it's an ongoing kind of game of creating the right incentives and making sure that your team is happy and growing. And yeah, this is what it takes to kind of grow is to make sure that your team is kind of aligned on your tracking goals and incentives. All right. So quick little recap. We just share with you five virtual law firm secrets. No, not virtual law firm, virtual assistant secrets. Number one is generally, generally, specialists will outperform generalists every time. Number two, have in mind the rule of twos whenever you're looking to hire VAs, hire in, 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 in pairs. Number three, make sure you have an SOP that clearly defines exactly what everybody on your team needs to do. You could use Google Doc and Loom to for this. If you need a template, you could join Lawyer Club to be able to get that for free. Number four, use an internal communication tool like Slack. Make sure everybody's there communicating and thriving together. And number five, the importance of incentives. There is a right way to be able to create incentives. Make sure you have an incentive program for your team if you're looking to grow. And Neil, we have an amazing next episode where we'll be talking about five reasons why your law firm's intake stinks. It's a clickbaity yeah. title, but packed with a lot of value. I look forward to talking about this, uh, discussing that. We appreciate you being here and we'll see you in the next episode. Absolutely. Take care.